live from the birdhouse it's saturday may 21st and today we're giving you an update on the avian influenza story and uh talking about different spring migrants and then also bird feeder setups so we've been getting lots of questions on how to best set up feeders for everybody um not only for the birds um but if you're doing other uh, other kinds of houses and then also how to best do your setup so they all get along because some of the birds like hummingbirds for example are quite territorial which you've probably noticed as always we love to see who's on you can say hi in the comments if you have any questions throw them in there and uh, of course we love to know what kind of birds you're seeing in your yard so you can throw those in there as well and I know as far as my sightings go, I've got a few photos to share with you, um, but, but I've been noticing the butterflies are starting to fly around quite a bit more. I've been seeing the cabbage white butterflies flying around in the garden and my mason bees are still active. So I've got this house. Um, this is the one I currently have. Well, I've got a couple, but <laughs> this is the one that's getting the most action. And this one's been great because when it rains, I noticed it's got this really nice metal sloping roof. So the rain will just fall over and it doesn't get anywhere close to the bees, which is great. So a lot of the houses we have now have this little kind of roof overhang. So you don't have to worry about the bees getting all um, all wet. So lots of bees coming and going still from my Mason Bee house. So there's still time if you want to try to get them. You might not get the whole thing filled up, uh, but they're still out and about in the garden. So especially if you're doing any kind of. Um, fruit trees. If you've got fruit trees, are great, great pollinators um, of fruit trees, apparently. So, which makes sense because they're out now when a lot of the trees are flowering. So, they're fantastic pollinators. And I'll share with you, too, a couple of my favorite garden things. I feel like these are kind of like the must haves of the garden. This is my absolutely favorite garden tool. I've bought all kinds of different things, but then I always just go back to this one. It's called a soil scoop. And I like it because it's got the serrated edges. So it's really good if you're trying to, to dig a hole and kind of get through some roots, it'll saw through those roots really well. Um, so I love this tool. I feel like I must have it in every single color. <laughs> it's really good. And if you are working in the garden, um, now is the time of year where if you're pulling weeds, you might have a little scuffle with poison ivy. So I thought I'd share our poison ivy soap. We do have that. This is awesome. So if you do have reactions to poison ivy, if you use this soap and wash, um, you know, wash your hands or arms or what have you after being in the garden, it'll help um, get uh, remove the oils of the poison ivy. So it'll help with um, with with that kind of breakout. Um, and what I've noticed too is that I do a lot of. Um, I grow a lot of hot peppers in the garden, do a lot of cooking with hot peppers. And if you're chopping up hot peppers and you get that oil on your hands, this will help break down that oil too. If you've ever had that experience where your hands feel burning <laughs> after dealing with hot peppers, um, that makes a huge difference. So I uh, thought I'd share that with you. And then also gloves. We carry a, a bunch of different gardening gloves. We've got some new fun styles in this year. I like these little tie-dye ones. And then we also have these kind of longer gloves which are going home with me today these are good for if you've got rose bushes or anything with um, you know thorns uh, because you'll notice that the thorns usually go through the gloves pretty well or they can they can get to your arms so these are nice and long to protect your arms and they've got some extra protection in the glove there to help so I've got a rose bush that is winning um, the battle and so those gloves are coming home with me today but um, let's get started here. I see a couple of you guys are on. Good morning, everybody. Stephanie says, good morning. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Dina. And let's see what we've got here. First, I uh, pulled up the maps. Again, of course, the migration maps. We're still in migration season. So um, as we've been looking day over day, we can see that of birds flowing into the U.S. from Central and South America. It's not as high as it was, say, a few weeks ago, but there's still a lot of movement coming through, especially in our area up here. So uh, for a while in the Midwest, it was just super bright. The, the lighter the color is, the more migration there is coming through. For a while in the Central U.S., it was just 
crazy um, and uh, it's kind of calm down there, but we're still seeing some pretty good migration here. In fact, uh, some people are just starting this week to see their first Orioles of the season. So um, if you haven't seen any, you never know, they might still be coming into the area. So um, a few weeks ago, uh, you know, there was almost 400 million, sometimes there were about more than 400 million birds coming through each night. And now it's a mere 185 million. So it's still a whole bunch of birds flowing into, uh, into the U.S. here from down south. So this was the predicted map from um, yesterday, from, from last evening going into today. And then as far as this evening goes, um, thinking these are storms, I think, right here, like these little outlines here. So we are supposed to get some storms, so that might affect some things. But um, going into tomorrow, there'll still be some migration activity, and then it's going to come down, it looks like, going into uh, Monday. So uh, as far as migration goes, it looks like last night was pretty good, if this map is accurate. So today is a good day to grab your binoculars and go out uh, birding. So I thought I'd give you guys an update as well of the avian flu. Um, I did a little bit of a deep dive on it over the past couple days. And um, there's been, since we last spoke on Tuesday, there's been one more report in the state. So it's still not a big deal with wild birds. If you look at this, the stats here, what's where it's really being affected is with poultry. So, um, and this is nationwide. So nationwide in the continental U.S., 1,190 wild birds have been affected, whereas almost 38 million uh, domestic birds have been affected. So it's really not an issue with wild birds. I scrolled through all of these reports, the 1,190 um, of the species affected, and there hasn't been a single uh, songbird. So it's mostly birds of prey. It's uh, waterfowl. So those are the two big uh, the two big groups of birds that have been affected. There's been a couple other random ones here and there, a couple shorebirds. I saw a great blue heron was one of them, but um, not a single songbird. So that's the good news. So as always, you should definitely keep your feeders clean um, your bird bats, especially this time of the year when everything is falling from the trees. If you have maple trees and they're just shedding all of those little propellers. I know I just cleaned up my bird bath last night and when I come home today from work, it's going to be full of stuff. So um, definitely keep them clean anyway. It's always important. And um, if you're doing some kind of bird bath maintenance. I've brought this up before. This is called bird bath protector. This is really good. These are just all natural enzymes you can put just a little capful in your bird bath when you refill it and it helps keep the water clean it just helps kind of break down some of that gunk that gets in there if you get kind of like a slime layer it can help break that down so that's really good and then um, if you want to keep your water moving there's the solar uh, bird bath bubbler or fountain. If you do have one of these, it's always good to rinse this out too, especially now when the trees are shedding so much. Um, it, it can sometimes clog the pump if you don't rinse it out often. So I thought I'd share that with you because I know a lot of you guys have this. And um, this will make your bird bath a little water feature, which I really like and the birds love. And if you want something to help uh, keep mosquitoes from being able to develop the uh, anything that agitates the water is going to be good because the mosquito larvae, the mosquitoes lay their eggs in the water, especially it's going to be the standing water and that larva will attach to the surface tension of the water. So they need that surface tension enabled for them to get oxygen. So if you break up that surface tension, they can't survive. So something like the solar bird bath bubbler would do that. And we also have something called a water wiggler. And this is, this is battery operated. So this will run all the time. So if you have a mosquito issue, this might be your best bet because it does run all the time. And the batteries last a really long time. So we've got a couple staff members that swear by these and the batteries they say last all season long. So you really don't have to change the batteries super often either. It's just, it looks like a little saucer, almost like a little UFO. And then there's a propeller that comes down and it just spins it just agitates the water. So this will help, this will definitely keep mosquitoes from being able to develop in your bird bath. So those are a couple things that happen this time of the year. So I thought I would share that with you. Um, but yes, going back to the stats 
here on the avian flu. Um, there's been 36 reports in New York, and I believe 11 or 12 of those are down um, by New York City. There have been two accounts in Monroe County. One was on April 8th, and that was a red-tailed hawk. And then there was another um, on, what was it? It was May 13th, and that was a peregrine falcon. So again, birds of prey. So there haven't been any songbirds affected in the whole U.S. with this disease. So you're still safe to have your, your feeders out and um, you can do that with peace of mind. So I thought we'd share that with you as well. But it's, of course, it's always important to keep those feeders clean. And then this is just a map showing the counties that have been affected. And you can see that there are some uh, up here and we've had two, um, two reports in Monroe County. And you can find all of this data if you get our emails. I sent a link um, in our last email to all this data, but it's on the CDC website. So even if you just look up bird flu, um, you should be able to easily find the, the CDC site that has all this stats. So you can keep up with it yourself as well. Um, so some sightings that I have had recently. Uh, I talked about a towhee in my yard. These are some better photos of the towhee. This was the first time I've ever had one, first and only time. It was around um, and from one evening into the next morning, and then I never saw her again. And this looks like a female eastern towhee because she's lighter in color. She's almost like a dark brown, and the males will be black in color. So this was a really cool sighting. She was hopping around in the yard and underneath the feeders and uh, on the fence there. So this is an Eastern Toei. This was the first one for my yard. So that was super, super exciting. And then just the other morning, I was, um, I heard a bird that I wasn't familiar with calling up in the tree and I couldn't tell what it was. Couldn't see it, of course. So I pulled out my Merlin app and um, sure enough, it was a Tennessee warbler. Of course, this app also picked up my usual suspects, the house sparrows, which are the dominant uh, species in my yard and house finch. I've been getting lots of house finch, but uh, Tennessee warbler was singing its little heart out. And uh, this was on Thursday morning. Um, it's got the date right on there. So what's cool about this Merlin app is that it will ID the sounds and then it also keeps your sound recordings too. So you can go back and see what it is you heard and when. So um, that was a new one for my yard as well. So it's kind of opened it up to uh, knowing the, what kind of birds you have in your yard that you're hearing that you don't necessarily see. So never caught a glimpse of it, but it was sure singing its little heart out. And then this is just a zoomed in picture of what the Tennessee warbler looks like. So um, it just goes to show you never know what you'll have in your backyard. Um, going down a little bit further south where I've got some property. We went down to check on the birdhouses and everything I have down there. And there were lots of tree swallows. So it's kind of an open, open area. There's some woods, um, but I've got lots of birdhouses out there and the tree swallows were back investigating and perching on top of the houses. So it looks like they're doing some nesting activity. And then there were bobolinks. The bobolinks are back and I love the bobolinks. They are going to be another one of those grassland species that like open areas, tall grasses. And um, you'll find them in the same kind of habitat. You might find bluebirds or meadowlarks. And this is the male here. And the male, were, there was a few males and they were all singing quite loudly. So that was exciting. They're in the blackbird family and they nest on the ground um, in tall grasses. So it's exciting to see them. And then kingbirds. Last year I had uh, kingbirds nesting. I was able to stumble upon their nest and um, there's a pair back of the kingbirds. So hopefully they'll nest again this year. And um, didn't get a good picture of it, but there are orioles nesting too. I stumbled upon some orioles building a nest. So that was really exciting. As far as local birding news goes, there was a black tern spotted out at Braddock Bay uh, recently. So if you're out that way, you never know, you might see uh, the black tern. So this is kind of a different looking bird you don't see every day. It's gonna be about the size of your typical kind of ring-billed gull, a little bit smaller than that, um, but doesn't quite look like anything else that we have around here. So one of the, uh, the Braddock Bay area this week. 
And you guys have been sending in your photos. It's a fun time of the year with lots of things flying in. This is a mystery bird sent in from Cheryl. He said, is this an orange finch? Sometimes um, the house finches kind of have an orangish wash. One of you guys sent in a photo of one. I think it might have been Bob. Um, where the the house finch instead of being red was kind of like an orangish color and so cheryl sent in these photos um saying is this an orange finch and um it looks like the bill on it is quite long for a finch it would be my uh was my first take on it and upon pulling out a couple different guidebooks i think it looks it's a female oriole so um if you look you can see this the, the little stripe that's going through the eye. Um, it's got kind of a wing bar there. And then the overall, um, the overall kind of yellowish orangish color without stripes on its breast make me think that it is a female oriole. So you just never know what kind of tricky birds you might find in your yard. So for identifying birds like this, I think the best book is the Crosley ID. Um, so we, we always talk about our Birds of New York book, but then there's another one called the Crosley ID Guide. And that one is awesome because it shows all the different plumages of the bird. It shows um, the male, female, juveniles in different years. Sometimes if they're the fir in their first year, they look different from when they're in their second year. So it has all the different plumages and it shows them in their habitat. So the background is the habitat that they're in. So that's an awesome book for identifying. So that I highly recommend that if you're trying to up your birding game, the Crosley ID guide is fantastic. So female Orioles are around. And now this is a brand new, uh, a brand new type of uh, type of behavior I've never seen before. So um, this was sent in by Lee, who was concerned when she saw this bird that was hanging upside down, a blue jay. Uh, so she was concerned that there might be something wrong with them. So she says he flew uh, he flew to the branch and then flopped upside down. Do blue jays hang upside down? I should mention I'm in Canandaigua and this was right before the thunderstorms rolled in last night. It squawked when it flew to the branch. That's what made me notice it. Within 15 seconds, it was hanging upside down. I got within about six feet of it to take pictures and it didn't move. The storm hit within 10 minutes and I didn't check, I didn't check it in on it until this AM. He's not on the ground. Uh, this am so he must have flown off pretty strange so um birds can do some very random things and so with a little investigation um our own angie who works here did a little research and she responded to lee saying some quick research reveals that blue jays have been observed roosting upside down similar to bats if it was seeking shelter from an incoming storm it's very possible so Interesting, interesting behavior. I've never seen a uh, blue jay doing this kind of thing, but it makes sense. If there was a storm rolling in and it, it wanted to you kind of protect itself, um, really, really interesting behavior. So the blue jay doing a bat impression there, really, uh, really new and different kind of behavior. And you guys have been out and about birding. We've gotten lots of photos in. Um, here's some more Baltimore Oriole photos. This was sent in by uh, Mark, who is at Erie Canal Lock 32. So more Orioles flowing in. They're definitely still around. They're starting to build nests. So um, they are, they're definitely still here. So um, keep those Oriole feeders full. They're, they are still coming to Oriole feeders. It doesn't seem to be at the point yet where they are not eating the nectar or, or, the, or the jelly and switching to mealworms. We don't seem to be there quite yet, um, but it can't hurt to put mealworms out sooner rather than later because other birds will start um, eating them as well and bringing them to their nestlings. So lots of Oriole photos out here. Um, this one's kind of fun. It looks like it's doing a, a about to do a chin up here. So it's another Oriole from Lock 32. And here's one uh, that was sent in by Rich, who's happy to have uh, some photos captured of their first Baltimore Oriole, and that's in the Penfield Webster area. So um, then uh, catbirds. So this is another type of bird you might see coming to your Oriole feeder. Um, this is at Kings Bend Park. And um, this was sent in by Mark also. And he says, along with a ruby-throated hummingbird that happened to fly in as well. One of the hummingbird pictures, you can see the tongue, I believe. The lighting had to hit it right as it was moving around a lot. Very neat to see. So this is a really neat thing to see here. So 
when you look at your hummingbird feeders, sometimes it's like, well, how hummingbird get to that nectar? Well, they have a really long beak, but then they also have a really long tongue, so they can easily dip into those feeders to feed quite easily. So really cool photo here where you can see that hummingbird tongue sent in by Mark. And then uh, some more hummingbird photos. This was sent in by Bob, who had his first hummingbird visitor. And then I think this is our first scarlet tanager picture of the season. Um, so this was again sent in by Mark, who says, fun sightings over the weekend, scarlet tanager at Mendham Ponds. So um, this is a bird that you'll you'll tend to see more um, in a wooded area. So if you're, you're in the woods, um, keep your ear out for them. Or if you see a bright a flash of bright, bright red, um, it's either going to be a cardinal or the tanager. And so if it has this black wing, it's definitely the scarlet tanager. There's nothing else that quite looks like it. It's more of a bright red than our cardinals even. So really magnificent looking bird there that was spotted at Mendham Ponds. And then this is another really cool one, not one you see every day. Um, this was at Kings Bend Park, a black crowned night heron. So um, they, these are more of a nocturnal bird. So you tend not to see them out during the day uh, unless you see them roosting. So this is going to be one that's more active around dusk and dawn. Um, but this is the black crowned night heron here. So really neat little heron there that was spotted. And then some shorebirds. This is a leased sandpiper at Kings Bend Park. A green heron. So green heron are definitely around. Here's another photo of the green heron going to be quite a bit smaller than your great blue heron. And if you're out by the water, keep an eye out for Virginia rail. People are seeing Virginia rail as well, kind of a secretive bird that you can find on the edges of ponds or in marshes. And, um, then here is a picture of a vireo. So this is the red-eyed vireo. And this was again sent in by Mark, who saw this at Mendham Ponds. And red-eyed vireo, this is a great photo because it shows how it gets its name, has that bright, bright red eye. And they are pr quite prolific singers too. So if they're around, you'll know it because they sing quite a bit. And then here's another vireo. So we do have different vireo species. This is a warbling vireo. And these are the different types that you can find around here. We've got the red-eyed vireo. We have the yellow-throated vireo. This is the blue-headed vireo, which is really cool looking. There's the Philadelphia and the warbling vireo. So we do have a few different uh, vireo species that you can find here in the area. And they do tend to sing quite a bit. So um, this is one that you can pick up pretty easily on your Merlin sound ID. And then uh, a cute photo here of a killdeer splashing around in, in the water. So another type of shorebird called the killdeer. And then um, here's some other shorebird species sent in um, by Mark. He says, at the Canal Widewater Lock 32 area, all of a sudden a flock of birds came flying in. Merlin ID says long-billed dowager. So uh, the shorebirds are, are definitely here. And there's a whole bunch of different types of those. They are... Difficult for me to identify, um, so I am going to take your word on it on that one, the long bill dowager. And you can see that they do have a very long, long bill there. So um, shorebirds can be a difficult one to tackle, but they're really cool. And there's a whole bunch of different ones around here. So here's another great photo of those. And then warblers, there's definitely still warblers around. Um, they can be harder to see now that the leaves are all coming out on the trees, but um, they're singing, they're starting their nests, their, their nest building. Um, I saw um, over last weekend, I saw a common one of these common yellow throats, just like this photo here, um, building a nest, which was really exciting. So they are definitely nesting and um, they're, they're still in the area. So you can still get your, your warbler spotting in. Here's a photo sent in by mark of a common yellow throat and also a blue winged warbler. So a couple different warbler species here um, that were spotted. And then goslings, if you've spent any time out by a pond, you've probably seen the baby Canada goose. Um, they are definitely out and about wandering around. And uh, this is a photo Mark sent in that says goslings on the move. And I thought I'd share again this photo sent in by Bob of an eastern meadowlark. So talking about birds that like open areas like grasslands, like that bobolink photo I showed earlier. 
the meadow lark likes that same kind of habitat. So this is a pretty rare bird at this point. Their populations are in really big decline. Um, so a sighting like this is quite special. So this is the eastern meadow lark. Really, really uh, beautiful bird who loves to sing also. And uh, this series of photos again, because it's so, so cool. Uh, Ed had sent in these pictures of the uh, Carolina wrens and they were, uh, they had their nest and you can even see the little, in this photo, you can see a little beak that's open. Um, so they had the, the eggs hatched, they had their, their nestlings there. Uh, here's a great photo of them all with their mouths open. And then shortly after, um, the, here are the nestlings all grown up and ready to leave. And they're f flying out and leaving the coop there and uh, one flew right onto Ed's hand. So really neat experience there with the Carolina wrens. And they're so funny because you can start to see um, their markings. You can start to see that stripe above the eye, but their tail is so short. So it hasn't, it, their, their tail feathers haven't totally grown in yet. So really fun photos there of Carolina wrens that are uh, leaving the coop there. And then we've been getting lots of questions and um, looking people looking for advice about how to best set up your bird feeders. So there's so many different things that you can do. Um, if you hang them from trees, that can work, um, but unless they're squirrel proof, the squirrels can get to them pretty easily. One of the easiest things you can do is just stick a shepherd's hook like this in the ground. And we do have shepherd's hooks that are adjustable. So you can actually raise and lower them, which are pretty nice. So you can um, fill your feeder, put it on the hook and then raise it up. So those are really nice. And these you can add a baffle to, to keep squirrels from climbing up. So shepherd's hooks are probably the most simple way to put up bird feeders. Um, and then most people that start off with a shepherd's hook ultimately move to something more elaborate, like a pole system that has more than just two hooks on it. And the pole systems are, are pretty nice. Um, this is what I have in my backyard. And mine has four hooks on the top, but then you can add additional hooks. So at the moment, I actually have five <laughs> hooks on mine. Um, but the pole systems are really good because they're very secure. So most people to put them into the ground, they get a ground socket like this. So this will just twist into the ground um, and it goes down deep. It goes down 20 inches. So you don't have to cement the pole in or anything like that. There's a hole that goes through the top here, you put a screwdriver in there and then you just twist it into the ground. So once this is in the ground, the pole slides onto the um, onto the base here. And then you can pick on the top how many hooks you want, whether it be two, three, or four. And so the pole systems are awesome because you can get them nice and tall and you can put the baffle on them so the squirrels can't climb up. And then you can put any feeders on them that you want. So the key with having the baffles work is you have to make sure they're up high enough. So every once in a while we get somebody saying, oh, the baffles, they don't work. The squirrel just goes over them. Um, well, that's true if they're down too low. I've seen some where the baffles are down, you know, just a couple feet off the ground. That's not going to do anything because the squirrels, as you've probably noticed, if you've done any kind of backyard bird feeding, the squirrels um, are quite nimble. And so they can jump four or five feet up high. They can also jump about seven feet across. So if you have a pole set up like this, and say you've got your deck or something right next to it, the squirrel can just jump from that deck right over the baffle onto the pole. So you wanna make sure it's at least seven feet away from something that the squirrel can launch from. If you have a tree up above, they are known to jump about nine feet from a tree or something up high down also. So uh, it can be a little difficult to find the right spot, but once you find the right spot, you can absolutely squirrel proof a pole system. So if you have a setup and, you're, and a squirrel's getting to it somehow, watch how they're getting to it because um, there, there should be a way around it. So the key is just watching and seeing how the squirrel's getting to it and then making adjustments. So um, these pole systems are great. This is a, what's called a baffle here. And um, this is probably our best seller. It's, it's a bullet style baffle, it's called. And it's not too huge. Like some of them are big cones, which work really well too. Um, they can kind of 
um, collect some debris and bird droppings and that kind of stuff. They all do. Um, so you want to rinse them off um, quite often. But um, this bullet baffle isn't too huge and, and it doesn't really, you know, interfere with the uh, with the look of the pole too much. And what happens is the squirrels will climb up this pole and they can't get around this baffle. So they'll climb up inside of it, get confused, and then they will just kind of slide down. So these pole systems are awesome if you're looking to kind of upgrade your um, your bird feeding system. And on a, a pole system like this, you can put a bunch of different feeders. So you can put your sunflower feeders, you can put your Niger feeder, your suet feeder, your, your seed log feeders. You can put all of those together and the birds will get along pretty well. I mean, you might get a, a grackle or something coming in once in a while that will scare everybody away. Um, that is just going to happen. But in general, you can put a bunch of different types of feeders together. Um, Oriole feeders you could put together with your other feeders. The Orioles tend to be a little skittish though, so I put my Oriole feeders separate just so they can have their own kind of peace and quiet area. And then um, hummingbirds are quite territorial. So with hummingbird feeders, you want to keep your hummingbird feeders separate from your seed feeders if possible. Um, you know, keep it maybe 10 feet away or so. Um, because the hummingbirds will sometimes scare off the other birds. So if you've got your hummingbird feeder next to your Niger feeder, for example, um, the hummingbird might zoom in and scare away the goldfinches from your Niger feeder. So they're very, very bold. And that's why we sell those, um, the hummingbird perches, those hummingbird swings. The idea there is you hang it in the area where you've been seeing hummingbirds, where they can oversee their territory and they'll perch on those and keep an eye out for their feeders. So if you're looking to attract a lot of hummingbirds, your best bet is to get several smaller feeders. You don't need anything too big because um, we only have the one species here. So the key is to put, get several different feeders and put them in different places in your yard. Um, if they're with if they're not in eyesight of each other, that's even better because the hummingbirds are so, so territorial. So I've got a setup like this in my backyard with the hummingbird feeder just on its own hook in its own location. So um, they don't have to, you know, tussle with the other, um, the other birds. We even have little hooks that can go into a garden or can go into a planter. So if you've got planter, um, little planter baskets or anything like that, or planter boxes, and um, you want to try to attract hummingbirds, you can just stick one of those in there and hang a little hummingbird feeder from it. So that's another option too. So um, we've got pretty large hummingbird feeders, but we also have really little ones that you could e easily just tuck into your garden here and there. So that is everything I have for you guys today. Let's see who is on. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments or any kind of sightings. Um, Osvaldo says, good morning, everyone. I saw a green heron in our pond this morning. My first black-billed cuckoo and many others. All right. So Osvaldo has some new sightings. So somebody else had a black billed cuckoo earlier in the week. Um, it might have been Bob who was on, said he heard one. So in the past, we've had um, some good uh, some good years with yellow-billed cuckoo, and they were the more predominant. So it'll be interesting this year to see if there's more black-billed cuckoo. Um, in general, the cuckoos eat a lot of caterpillars. So um, in the, the past year, when there's a lot of um, caterpillars around from the gypsy moths, the cuckoos eat a lot of those. So that could be why there's so many if they had really good luck with breeding last year because there was so much food to feed their young, there might be a stronger population out there now due to having an, a, an abundance of food. Um, Randy Zani says, good morning, Liz and everyone. Rich is on. He says, good morning. Orioles have been visiting periodically. Jelly is still their favorite. Starlings have been hogging our suets. Yes. I am in the same boat there. The suet cakes, they have just been flying through and I can't keep them, the suet feeder full for more than a day or so. Um, so here's a photo here, here's which is Oriole, possibly the same one. He's still getting, eating the jelly still. And yeah, starlings are definitely around eating all kinds of seed and uh, 
to it. Definitely. Um, Ed is on. He says, good morning, Liz and all having better success this year with the Mason Bee House. We've had the same one you showed. Last year, we only had seven tubes filled, and this year we have 11 so far. Also, we're seeing male and female Orioles and indigo buntings at our feeders. Love those buntings. Yeah, so I've had that same experience in general with mason bee houses. So this is the one Ed's talking about. We both have the same one. Um, and the first year I put one out, I got a few of the holes filled. And then the, the second year, there were more and more. And it seems like every year, it just expands and there's more and more of them filled. So um, I think probably when they hatch out of there, they tend to come back. They don't have a huge range as far as where they uh, move around and travel to. So they probably stick around in the same, uh, you know, the same yards, the same neighborhoods, if you will. So it would make sense that every year you have more and more as you're building that population. So I'm glad that's I'm glad that's happening. I'm glad that's working for you. And indigo buntings, how cool is that? Yeah, indigo buntings will come to feeders um, sometimes. Uh, with, if you're lucky enough, you'll get one. And they eat Niger, they'll eat millet, they'll eat sunflower hearts. So some of those smaller seeds are really good for the buntings. I should mention too, when Rich was talking about the starlings, if you're trying to keep them away, safflower is the way to go. Um, safflower in general, people have um, pretty good luck with. This is a safflower log. I put these in my backyard. Um, so the cardinals and the grosbeaks always have something and um, the, the starlings don't really like this. Um, I've been getting house finches devouring this like crazy, but the starlings don't like it. It can take a bit for the other birds to get used to it. So um, that can be the only downside, but once they start getting used to it, they'll come pretty pretty often. So that's something else that you can do um, to keep away those starlings. So Dina's on, she says, lots of warblers in my backyard high in the trees. I heard some singing that didn't sound familiar. Thanks to Merlin for informing me. I managed to spot a yellow warbler and a bay-breasted warbler. Ooh, so amazed that I didn't that I didn't have to even leave my backyard to enjoy these. Still trying to spot the Tennessee and Cape May warblers, etc. Yeah, it's amazing. I heard, uh, so on top of the Tennessee warbler, um, a couple weeks ago, I heard a black-throated green warbler outside in my backyard too, or front yard actually. So yeah, you just never know what you're gonna see or, or hear. Um, Randy says, two herons this week flew by and chickadees are back. Awesome, okay. Uh, Margaret says, Liz, I also recorded the Tennessee Warbler on Thursday morning. All right. So Margaret and I both had Tennessee Warblers singing um, earlier in the week. So I wonder if maybe we had a little influx of them on Thursday morning. This is my little recording here from, uh, it looks like 717 in the morning of the Tennessee Warbler singing. And actually I could pull up what it sounds like uh, because it does have a pretty uh, a pretty interesting kind of like a buzzy call so let's pull up my tennessee warbler again on my merlin app i've never used an app so often in my life <laughs> so it's kind of like some little chirps and then at the end in succession they go a lot quicker so that's the tennessee warbler so Really cool. Margaret also had some in her yard. Um, and then here's Lynn with the Tennessee Warbler. She says the Tennessee Warbler was in my yard yesterday. Love its call. All right. So um, sounds like we had quite a bit of Tennessee Warbler activity this week, which is exciting. It's funny how it all kind of comes around at the same time. Um, let's see. Yvonne says, I heard an American wet red star at Webster Park on Wednesday. I never heard of that kind of bird before. So American red star is another type of warbler and they're, um, they're black with bright orange, uh, with bright orange patches on them. And, um, yep. Another warbler species you can find in the area. Um, there's a lot of them at thousand acre swamp. I always see a lot there. They nest there. So that's a good place to go if you're looking for American red star. Um, Dina says, I also spotted my very first bluebird in my yard this week with the binoculars. Very exciting. All right. Another great sighting. Um, Yvonne says, I use the Merlin app. I saw it. Uh, let's see. I used the Merlin app. I saw it on a branch high up in a tree and didn't have the good camera. So that's the American red start that Yvonne um, heard and saw, but she didn't have the good camera, which I understand very, very well. Um, Stephanie says, our goldfinches have been abundant and now are rare. Did they migrate away? So that's a good question that we get 
all year round. And finches are kind of strange in that way. You can have a whole bunch of finches for weeks or months, and then all of a sudden they just disappear. They tend to just wander naturally. So that's kind of just their behavior where they'll stay in one spot for a while and then just move on to another. So they nest pretty late in the season. Although with my nesting ball, if you guys have these, um, the nesting ball of the natural cotton, I've been getting goldfinches pulling out nesting material on it already, which seems early because they nest late in the season. They tend to not start nesting until around July. And, um, but I had a female pulling out some nesting material. So um, I don't think they're nesting yet. It would be kind of early. They don't really nest until a lot of plants go to down. So um, plants like thistle and milkweed, once they uh, go to seed and the seeds have all of that downy material, the goldfinches will use that to nest. And um, so now would be a little bit early for them to just be going but they just, they do wander. So they might just be wandering on um, for months. I didn't have finches at all for months, um, probably almost a full year. And then all of a sudden, maybe two months ago, they all started coming back. So where they were, I don't know, but um, it, that is just their behavior. And um, it's, uh, it's quite unlike a lot of other birds. So interesting, interesting little guys. And I should mention too about the goldfinches that um, while a lot of birds will switch their food in the summer months, they'll naturally switch to a diet of more insects. Goldfinches are one of the rare birds that don't do that. They actually stick to seeds all year round. So while as other birds are now picking off insects in the trees or drinking nectar from blooms of plants, goldfinches don't do that. They stick with seeds all year round. So they do come to feeders all year because they are eating seeds a lot all year. So they might just be wandering somewhere else. Um, let's see. Randy says yellow belly woodpecker. Been here a few times. One just left. Could be a flicker. Um, Lynn says, do hummingbirds favor plastic feeders? I switched to glass and not seeing as many birds so far. I don't, as far as I've heard, um, they don't really have a preference. Um, if you do switch sometimes in general with bird feeders, it can take the birds a little bit of time to get used to the new feeder. So we hear that all the time. Someone will put out a new bird feeder and it can be right next to their other feeders and it can take the birds a couple weeks sometimes to get used to feeding from it strangely enough so that could be the reason um i've used in general all of mine have been those plastic humzinger type of feeders that are the dishes um but i just switched to a glass one um and they don't seem to have of a preference like this feeder here is called the humzinger and this has been a really popular one it's been around forever um super easy to clean the top pops off and it has this nice high perch so the hummingbirds can can perch on the feeder and still survey their their territory so that might be the only difference if you have a glass one that's kind of um uh, i don't know if i have a picture of one that's kind of like um tall yeah I don't have a picture of one but if you have one that's um kind of like a tall glass cylinder and then the base they might not be able to see around it so that might be why that would be my best guess so something like this the humzinger is good because they can survey the whole area around them when they're feeding so that would be my only guess of why they would prefer one over the other um let's see Vicki says for 30 years I've been hoping for bluebirds to find my houses in my yard a week ago, I returned from our winter home to find a pair apparently feeding their nestlings. I'm doing a happy dance, LOL. Now I am watching them defend their home from predators. Also blessed with cardinals, blue jays, red and gold finches, wrens, nuthatches, chickadees, three different types of woodpeckers, and hummingbirds. I am convinced it is due to, and then it cuts off, so I don't know, there must be... Um, a max amount of of characters but as far as your um your bluebirds go depending on what the predator is we might have something that can can uh, help with that if you're still on i'm curious if it's a mammal predator if it's something like a raccoon or a squirrel um that's trying to raid the box we have these little tunnels called um called bird guardians they screw onto the outside of the 
house and they're just they they're a tunnel so they, they're about this long and they make the entrance hole that much longer of the house so a predator can't reach in and pull out the eggs or nestlings um Oh, Vicki says, I'm convinced it's due to the guidance and bird supplies by the birdhouse. Thank you. Oh, of course, Vicki. Um, yeah, so I'm curious if you're, it looks like you are still on what kind of predators that it, um, they are depending from because um, if it's mammals, we do have those tunnels you can put on the outside of the house. If it is something like a sparrow, we do have the sparrow scarers, which are the reflective tape. And we now have a kit that will screw right into the top of the house and it's reflective tape. And that will... Um, you know, that'll go down in the top of the house. And birds don't like shiny reflective objects, but because the bluebirds are, have a stake in the game, they've got their eggs in there and they've got their, um, now their nestlings, they won't abandon the house. So even that reflective tape won't scare them away, but that can scare the sparrows away. So if that's what you've got going on, we do have something that can help with that. So hopefully that's helpful and hopefully they're able to bring those young to, uh, to, to term and they're able to fledge successfully. So it looks like that's everybody's comments and questions. I'm curious what kind of birds we might see or hear over the next few days, especially with everybody getting those neat warbler, um, neat warblers in their backyard. Just goes to show you never know what's out there. Um, another thing I should mention too, as we get birds migrating in um, are window strikes can be a big issue and you can prevent them by putting decals on your window. And the decals we saw the most of are these. They're basically clear to our eyes. You can kind of see the packaging here. Um, these are in the shape of a leaf. When you put them on your window, you put them on the outside of your window. And um, to us, they're, they're basically just clear, but they reflect UV light and birds can see in the UV spectrum. So they see that there is something on the window and these can really help with bird strikes, which are uh, really a, a really uh, big issue for birds migrating in. Um, lots of birds are killed by window strikes. So um, you can put something like this on your window to help prevent that. So um, that's been another issue people have been having recently with lots of birds flying, uh, flying into the area that aren't familiar with it. So that looks like everybody's comments and questions for the day. We'll be back on Tuesday with another broadcast. And until then, enjoy your weekend and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.